And here we have it. The man of the hour. That when you watch a movie, you ask yourself, who was that guy that played that part? Wow. He is so transformable playing these authentic characters. And you say to yourself, that is Vincent D'Onofrio. Welcome to the show, baby. Thanks, sir. It's good to be here. <laughs> so how you feeling? Good. You know, as good as everybody can be these days. You know, it's a crazy world we live in. But, uh, yeah, I'm uh, just coming off a, a, a class that I've been teaching uh, for a week at the Strasbourg Institute in New York, but, you know, on Zoom, of course. And um, so that's, that's, I had some incredible students. So I'm coming off on a kind of really awesome vibe from doing that because the, they were so talented. And, um, you know, I'm here in the city with my sons. My, my wife is upstate because um, we get better internet here. So I came <laughs> for the class and for you. Yeah. But good, bro. How are you? Phenomenal. It's an honor to have you. You know, speaking of training as an actor, Vince, when you were, you know, how seriously, how seriously is it when it comes to training, if you really want to be a good actor? Please emphasize that because I always tell people training, if you want to be transformable, you got to train. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're correct. I, I do, however, you know, I, and I know you know this already, but it would be, um, it wouldn't be cool if we didn't mention the fact that, you know, al uh, 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 along the, the journey of my career, my life, actually, um, that, that I've, I've been with incredible actors that, that uh, never trained. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that, and this is what I think you're getting at is that, you know, having explored and, and worked with those actors, the ones that didn't put in a lot of actual training with a teacher and such, that in the end, um, you realize eventually, especially if they're great at what they do, you realize, especially, um, which, which is what's important here is that they're, they're doing actually what people study do, except they have found it on their own. And it all stems from really basic Stanislavski, um, the first 10 years of Stanislavski, and then, and then um, after that, the Stanislavski system, which was a different system in the first 10 years. And so whether they've never had training, whether they trained in Britain or anywhere, or Hungary or anywhere in the world, or Italy or um, Australia or, you know, wherever the actor is from and wherever the actor studied, eventually, as they gain experience and as they, their chops become something they can depend on, it's all Stanislavski. Right. Right. But, you know, Vin... When I see you transform into these characters, I notice your voice and speech, your physicality. Yeah. You know, that's really hard to do because people could fall into caricature like you're imitating. And it's really, you know, well, what's your process with that? How do you work on your voice and speech when you're actually portraying a character and you say to yourself, well, I feel like this guy sounds like this or he sounds like that. You know, how do you do that? Well, I cheat like all the other actors and actresses. I study and I practice and I, you don't get to see it until it's, um, you know, as close to a hundred percent as I can get it. I mean, we can never achieve a hundred percent, but our, you know, our struggle to get there is constant and that's what the audience gets, you know, as my performance. So, you know, I'm like any uh, actor that or actress that loves what they do. I, you know, I don't mind putting the time in. You know, it, uh, and also it's all I have. So you know, other than um, my children and my dogs, and you know, <laughs> and my who and my wife who runs everything. Mm -hmm. in my, um, that's all I have is my acting. 
So um, I I put all my uh, time into it. But do you do you craft even when you're just hanging out? Like, are you thinking about something? You know what I mean? Like, let's say you're walking around on the in the streets in Manhattan, and you're just like, I wonder if, if hmm, this is this is interesting. If you saw something, do you craft like that too? Totally. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm not distracted, or I mean, or if I'm not doing something else that I'm enjoying more, if I'm by myself, for sure, yeah, I can't help it. I mean, my close friends in the business, um, especially the closest ones that I have, we, we're always talking. We're not talking about actual acting, but we're always talking about. Uh, humanity and our own humanity yeah. and our own failures and our own successes and we're, we're always talking about behavior always you know not in a, a mushy kind of actory kind of way but you know yeah we are always a couple of sentences away from art you know always and it's not it's it's at my age and at their ages now um it's it's become our nature. It's not something we try to do or even consider only when asked, um, like you did now, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the truth. And, and, you know, like it is right now, it brings a smile to my face because it is so much a part of my life and my friendships and, um, the people that enlighten me and inspire me, you know, mm -hmm. you know, a prime example Vince, is that, you know, for the movie Men in Black, you were trying to create this character, but then you had to figure out how is he going to walk? So you're in Manhattan and you see a mannequin with knee braces and you're like, hmm, let me go inside and check it out. And then what do you tell the guy, the worker to do? What you what you ask him to do? Because this is a great story. This is what I love about artistic actors they always crap and i love that you know so tell me that story well i have to i'll start from the beginning of it so and barry barry sonnefeld is the director who i just love and if he was here right now i'd give him a huge hug because i just love that guy um i am allowed to tell this story um without screwing up barry and my friendship because um uh he tells the story too so um, so, so basically I was approached to do that part, um, uh, by a mutual friend, uh, Barry and mine or, or coworker, uh, slash friend. Um, and she was, she was asked by Barry to bring me this script or no, to ask me first on the phone. She called me and she, she said, Sonnenfeld, Barry Sonnenfeld wants me to ask you is, if you will read a script, but you have to promise you'll never speak about acting. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, I don't want to speak about acting. I'm, I'm it. I'll, you know, cause I already knew who he was from his, um, <clears throat> cause he was a DP for the Coen brothers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I said, yes. And, the, and then very soon after that, I got, I got the script and I read this thing and, and obviously I'm reading this part that has, it's just the, that the, 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 the role that he was considering me for was a, you know, was very kind of blueprinty. There was no, no, you know, the guy's name was Edgar and he, it, the director said, don't talk about acting. Don't talk about acting. So I mean, you can imagine reading the script for the first time that, that story. And I'm thinking, holy cow, this is amazing but I talk to the actor. This is insane, you know? Right, right. Um, so um, I just found it to be a challenge. And so I uh, I went and I met Ferry in, in, uh, at his house in, in New York and um, I think in the Hamptons. And yeah, and um, we didn't talk about the, the he, we, we didn't, we talked about the movie, but we didn't talk about the part. We, we didn't talk about the movie much. We just talked about Stanley Kubrick and stuff. And um, and then the next thing you know, he, he gave me the role, and then I had to figure out how to do it. And so um, I remember I, ha I was in doing another movie in Los Angeles.
just like the time. So was, I was there, I was in New York, and I was trying to figure out how to do the part. And I remember watching, like, you know, doing really actory kind of things, like watching, like, documentaries on bugs and blah, blah. And I'm telling you, it was so freaking boring. I couldn't take it, uh, <laughs> honestly. It was, like, so uninspiring. I remember after so many watching so many documentaries on insects and stuff because i wanted to think of movement and all that kind of stuff and i remember very distinctly or sitting there with my friend steve and we're watching this beetle walk across this porch and the camera kind of zooms in on it and tracks this beetle really slowly and i'm just like you know what this is fucking ridiculous and i just turned it and and uh I was kind of stumped for for about six or seven hours. Um, I went for a walk uh, down the street. I was in Beachwood Canyon at the time, so I walked down to the down the canyon and um, uh, I, I walked around. I was walking. I walked over to Sunset, and I passed a uh, sporting goods store, a small sporting goods store, but but it was. Um, it also had, it, but anyway, so for the first, I'd never really seen braces that basketball players wore on their knees, you know, for injuries and stuff like that. And for some reason, they had this whole, I don't know why, but they had this whole thing set up where they had this mannequin with these two braces on and on, on these. And I'm like, oh, shit, like I could wow. buy a couple of those. Because I was thinking this giant bug has to fit inside this human body. So he's not going to be able to move well. And so I thought I need to restrict. It all came to me in one go when I saw those braces. And so I went in and I bought these two pairs of braces. And, the, you know, yeah, the guy the guy was wondering, you know, the guy said, you have bad knees? And I'm like, no, no, I'm going to play an alien in a movie, you know. And it's, <laughs> oh, okay, whatever. Imagine how many times he hears things like that. Right. <laughs> And and uh, it, it, uh, you know uh, in a sporting goods store near Sunset. Um, so I went home with those two braces, and I got um, oh, and I also stopped at a hardware store and got some um, paint mixer uh, pieces of wood and a bunch of duct tape. And uh, with the wood, uh, so I put the braces on, and I stood and I bent my knees slightly and. Um, I taped it off uh, using help, the help of the, the wood um, to not be able to rope, uh, to bend or straighten my legs. Mm -hmm. And so I did the same thing with my ankles, but I used only the, um, th this is crazy, I know, but I used only the wood, the, the painter stick wood and, and masking tape, and I bound my feet. This is just, um, you know, as an experiment. And then I just tried to walk normal, as, as normal as I could, to oh, yeah. pretend like there was nothing wrong. And that's how I came up with the walk. And then um, the voice, um, I wanted, um, I always loved uh, John Houston's voice, and I knew uh, his son, Danny, who talked very similar, but not quite as over-enunciated and drawn out as... Um, John Houston, mm -hmm. you know, he used to say things like this and that and whatever. He spoke like that. Mm -hmm. And so I like that. Um, for instance, one of the lines in the movie is pond scum. To say it's pond scum, like John Houston would be pond scum, like that. Oh, okay. And, but the problem is, is that he his cadence is too slow. And I knew that would be uh, uh, not exciting enough. So I, there's a great, incredible, inspiring performance when I was a kid of uh, George C. Scott's in Dr. Strangelove. Well, he kind of talks like this all the time, really quick, like this, like that, like that. And, and so I combined the two. So pond scum, like the, that's the combination of both of them together. It would be pond scum. Like so it's that. Combine those two voices and then Barry didn't know that until I didn't know any of it. Never saw it until the first day of shooting. And um, it made everybody quite nervous, I have to say. But you but, you see what I mean, how you craft, like, that voice. I mean, you know, how many people could actually do that? 
That's really hard to do. Well, hopefully a lot. <laughs> People can hopefully do it. Hopefully a lot, but can you make it real like, you know, great actors do? You know, like, it's really hard. I mean, you, look, think about it. It took you for the figure it out seven hours that day. But like, oh, thank God for the sporting goods store, right? Yeah, totally. Because I really don't know. Um, I'm just not. That's it. That's the extent of my talent. I, I don't know how I would have come up with that character um, unless I saw those things. It was a giant, like, boom kind of moment. Um, that happens a lot. I, I don't think, I mean, I think a lot of it is by accident. I don't think all of it's by accident because I do have, I've been taught by my teachers when I was a kid and I've been so inspired by other writers and directors and actors and musicians and painters in my life and you know I, I the way they think and how they're always exploring you know it's so it's sort of by accident and sort of from my inspirations and enlightenment from you know my own experience I think. well here's the walk Vince since I have a great software here I mean look at this look at that look at that and then you be like don't even think about it. the guy <laughs> I love yeah. that <laughs> oh man you know, yeah. so, yeah, and that's what I mean. I, I really believe in that uh, actor that's transformable could do things like that with the physicality, the movement, the voice and speak, you know, and some actors, they play great themselves. That's fine. You know, they're authentic. Yeah. I mean, I love playing, I love, love playing things as close to myself. It's just as difficult um, mm -hmm. um, as, you know, one of my good friends is Ethan Hawke and, you know, I I hold him up in such high regard, not just, you know, because he's a friend, but because of his ability from when he was very young all the way up into now and his performances that he's able to, um, the way, you know, he and others are able to do that leading men stuff, I find it to be so inspiring and, uh, you know, it's so legitimate and wonderful, you know. So here's my question. You know, you were a bouncer. Did you get your toughness from growing up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn? Because I'm very familiar with that neighborhood. <laughs> You're familiar with 18th Avenue, 6th, 5th Street, that area there? Yeah, my high school was close. My high school was FDR on 20th and 58th Street. Yeah, so my story is, is that uh, I didn't go to school there. Um, but a lot of my education came from there because I lived in my grandfather's house. Uh, my when my parents were divorced, we were in Florida, and my mother took us to Hawaii, and I spent some time in Hawaii. We went to, I think, a couple of years of elementary school, or maybe one year, and then uh, when she um, felt good about herself, because she was raised there, uh, my mom, because her side of the family went. Um, from most pretty much from Hawaii, from, from Italy to Hawaii, from Naples to Hawaii. Because my grandfather, Minicola, uh, uh, Rocco Minicola, he, he, um, he opened the, the first like, chicken Italian restaurant in Honolulu. Oh. And yeah, back then, yeah. Oh. Back during, uh, yeah. Uh, and um, so, she was raised there, so she took us back there to her family, and then eventually we ended up in Florida. So, um, the you know when it comes to the whole bouncer thing, and then every so I was going to say so every summer, um, uh, every summer of my life back then I spent with my grandfather in his house and and my grandmother up until she died as well, and um, and so I used to go to work with my grandfather. And uh, so my whole Italian American New York influence is my grandfather's world. He was a. Um, this is on my dad's side now, not my mom's side. My mom's side was in Hawaii. Now I'm talking about my dad's side, and his name was Vincent D'Onofrio, mm -hmm. and named after him, obviously. And and he 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 his world was he was a um, originally a an upholsterer 
Um, that's what he studied, upholstery. And he eventually opened a company called General Drapery, which which was very successful for him. He did all of the, um, so much of the upholstery and drapery that went on in New York back then and in the hotels and all the big hotels and all that kind of stuff. He he was a hard worker and he was hands-on and he went to work every morning and worked his ass off all day long. Him, So are we still around? Yeah, 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 with me, yeah. So we, so he, um, so my world was that world. And so all those, all the New York men and women in my life come from my grandfather's world. So that, my biggest Italian American New York influence is because of my grandfather. And um, as far as the bouncing and stuff, the, um, that's Florida, Brooklyn, that's, that's everything. And, mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, we, we, we money so you know my mom supported three kids um on a on a waitress salary from from denny's and uh you know it was tough you know florida was a tough place to grow up where i did it was it was um we were all on the street um when we weren't in school if we were in school and and uh it was you know nasty 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 so you were you you grew up in hialeah miami Hialeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, that's pretty tough down there, man. Because <laughs> I I played college baseball down in Florida, so you know we used to go to Hialeah. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was it, when I was a kid. Um, that was all, everything it is now. The toughness, of the the brutality that's that's there now, although it still has obviously incredible things about it because of the Cuban people are just so amazing yeah. Um, yeah. the Cuban people were just starting to come in to that area then and but before they they started to fill out the population there it was all of us kids from all over the country living in this area and we were all uh, had no jobs and our parents were you know working a couple of jobs and we were on the street. We were we were on the street, you know. But that's and, uh, the toughness thing. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I you know the toughness. You know, you know, you're only as tough as your last punch in the mouth that that's you've true. taken. Well, you know, the same thing in sport. Only good as your last at bat. <laughs> By the way, Dominic Lombardozzi just put added on the top the comments right here. Where is he? Hold on a minute. Look what he said about you. He loves you, by the way. Here it is. Look at that. Yeah, he's an awesome guy. Right? Isn't he a great guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just starting to get to know him. But I actually reached out to him after I saw him on on your show, after you reached out. No, I think, I don't know who reached out first. but No, I reached out to you. I said, hey, Vincent, how about you come on my show? Before we leave off of Dominic, I think he's, uh, you know, just like one of the, you know, most honest actors. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just starting to uh, develop a friendship. Yeah. No, well, you know what? You guys should meet up because he's a great guy. Great guy. You guys in the city, hang out. <laughs> Talk acting. <laughs> Talk artistry with him. So here's the thing, Vince. You know, you went to acting school in New York City. It must have been a hard life for you because you got to work all night at a club or guarding somebody, and then you got to study throughout the whole day in school. So give me your schedule back then. What time was school? What when did you have time to craft? When did you have time to do your homework? Um. So when I started studying in New York, it was um was every day. Mm-hmm. Um, it was at the American Stanislavski Theater Company uh, with a woman uh, named Sonia Moore, who was the teacher, was the head of the school and one of the teachers who, and a couple of teachers worked under her. Um, she had a company that toured with the older group of actors that had been part of her, her troupe. And um, so we were, we were every day. So I would work nights. So I would go in and uh, with my and with my sister who was studying acting with me and my 
uh, best friend who I actually met at that school, Stephen Marshall. And we, the three of us, we'd go in in the afternoon and we'd, we'd be there for several hours um, until the early evening. And we, we'd have, get to study, you know, we were studying the Stanislavski system of acting. This is before I um, studied method acting. Um, I learned, you know, half of what I know as an actor from Sonia Moore and that troupe of actors um, in that school and those teachers at that school. So, so it was, it was a, it was a full day, and it was there was speech and there was um, learning the classics and understanding the classics, everything from Tennessee Williams to Chekhov to just all the the Russian writers and 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 all the uh, the classic American writers and um, yeah that that's that that's what it was like at night I would go to um, bounce at a at a club um, back then it was places like um, well it was early punk days so all the early punk clubs and then eventually uh, uh, I worked at um, the Ritz opened up, which used to be Webster Hall and became like this rock club um, on 11th Street between 3rd and 4th. And, and I worked there for, for many years at the front door and, um, and, and upstairs. and Like two to three floors, Webster Hall, right? The Ritz? Yeah. yeah. It's a crazy place. That was a crazy place, man. You, was a- you were also at um, Studio 54? At the back door, I worked sometimes at the back door, yeah, and uh, wow. it was crazy all that. Oh, because that you know, like a, a lot of the that scene at night, um, you know, you could grab a job here and there and everywhere, and you know, stuff like that. You know, so the, those, those disco clubs that were still around during um, when rock and roll came back, those there was a couple of disco clubs that were still around, and um, I, I worked some of those. Um, yeah, they were super popular places like Studio and Xenon and stuff like that. But but, you know, I I you know I I didn't drink. I didn't uh, do drugs. I didn't do anything like that back then. At, at that stage of my life, um, um, I you know I was very and I was very ha- I'm In hindsight, I'm very happy I didn't because I'm I was so aware of mm-hmm. everything. You know, I didn't miss a trick. And also I was, um, you know, usually me and a couple other guys and girls who were sort of the straight ones, we, um, you know, we were on it for everybody else. Like we would pick up on things before most people. And so we were able to uh, keep a lot of bad shit from happening sometimes. Sometimes bad shit happened anyway, but, you know, it was good to be sober uh, back then and young. You know. you know, you're six four. I mean, I don't think someone will mess with you. But did you ever have a situation that you really threw the guy out? Like, don't even try to mess with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Has it ever happened? Um, rather than talk about that stuff, I would rather talk about the first time I met a hell's angel. <laughs> okay, what happened in that one? <laughs> you know. Um, I won't say their names, but some of them are um, were inc- incredibly um, uh, enlightening. Um, you know, <laughs> I remember the first time he was a he was quite something. This guy, um, you know, he walked up to the rope, and I and the boss had just told me to not let any hell's angels in because he heard that they were coming. What club was this? This is at the Ritz. Okay. And sure enough, around midnight or so, twelve motorcycles pulled up and parked. And you know, you know how loud they are. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of shock and awe thing. That's mm-hmm. awesome the way. Um, uh, and and they they all pulled up in front. And there's one particular guy. Um, I'll never forget him. He was like six seven. And he wore a, uh, well, I won't get too specific, but he uh, walked up to the ropes and he said, open up. And I said to him, 
the boss says that there's no uh, Hell's Angels allowed. And you said it in a nice way, just like that. I, 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 you know, he, he you know, I'm six four. He was six seven. So I'm looking up at this guy. <laughs> okay. Whose shoulders were twice as wide as mine, and um, and you know, also back then, I, uh, you know, I didn't look like I look now. I was like this long, lanky kid, and and um, he said he he looked. Direct, he didn't pause a second, just looked directly back at me in a very calm voice, not trying to be intimidating. He said, look, open the rope or I'll walk through it. Mm. And uh, I opened it, you know, click, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right away, here you go. <laughs> I opened it up, yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it, 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 you know, I, I, it's, it's like I said before, Eddie, look, you know, there's always someone that's gonna that can put you on your ass when you're young. Mm -hmm. There's always someone that can beat you badly. You know, it's not about how tough you are. Um, it's about how smart you are. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it, so so yeah. You know, there were times when people were got into really rough situations. You know, I never threw anybody out because I didn't like them. I just threw them out because they needed to get control of themselves. Right. You know, we had this thing. I used to do it, and I, and I, I learned it from the best uh, bodyguards and, and bouncers um, at the time that were around in New York that um, you talk, you talk, you talk, you talk, you talk, you keep talking, and you say, L I can't hear you. Let's go out. Let's go out near the front door because I can't hear you. It's too loud. Let's have a real conversation, you know. And even when somebody's drunk, 99% of the time, they understand that, that you want to speak to them and they can't hear you. And, and look, I, I don't want you. I kept, I would always say to them, which wasn't always true. I used to say, I don't want to escort you out of here. Let's just go talk about this for a moment. Give me a moment of your time and let's see if it works out. And... Um, I would get them all the way outside. And then I would say, look, you know, you're causing problems inside. And I would talk to them about it. And then if it got violent, it was because they got violent with me. And then then it was just about um, controlling the situation, you know, trying to control the situation. But it didn't always go my way. I you hear know? you. Well, that's life. That's being human. It's not going to always go your way. But this went your way. Matthew Modine walks by the neighborhood, actor Matthew Modine, and tell and you ask him how you doing, and he says I'm doing good. I'm gonna be going to London, right? You now to shoot Full Metal Jacket, but there's a part that you should audition for. Now mm. think about if Matthew Modine wasn't in that neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? If he didn't pass by you, would you be the guy cast in Full Metal Jacket? No. You see what I mean? But that's an accident. And it was an accident that became a great accident. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, you know, he, it, it, I don't know if you know this part of the story, but him and I, we knew each other from auditions and stuff. Right, and exactly. And we, we, also, we also studied at the same place for a short time. And, um, and, and so, yeah, that's exactly what happened. He was walking. I was at the. I was working at the front door of the Hard Rock Cafe um, when it first opened on 57th Street. Um, it's it's no longer there anymore. It's on Broadway. But um, yeah, him and his wife Carrie walked by, and he he was already out there uh, prepping or shooting. I think shooting, and he was take. They were they were on a break because Stanley Kubrick takes really long periods of time, like. Mike, I was, I'm only in the movie for 30 to 40 minutes and, and it took 13 months. I was working with him for 13 months, just for 30 or 40 minutes. So yeah, he, so he was, and yeah, so exactly. He told me, and then I sent a tape like 3000 other people that wanted that part, you know, and Stanley called me. Yeah. Actually, I'll tell you one thing. They received 3000 tapes. And they went over 800 with, with Stanley. And um, you were the guy. But here's my question. When you rented the camera with your friend, 
a self tape. Now back then it wasn't really self tapes like it is now, you know. No. But you rented a big ass camera. You do it in the backyard. You send it in. But did you remember in that monologue what choice you made? I mean, I know we're turning back the clock, but did you remember you said I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do it this way? Did you remember that choice? Well, the first time, the first tape, I sent a piece, a monologue from a piece I was doing already. So whatever I was doing in that piece when I was performing it at the time in a play, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would have done what I did. The first time we did it, we did it on a stoop on 21st Street and 10th Avenue on a front stoop. Stair, stair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then a few weeks later, after he got it, he called me and said, he said that he was going to send me some words that he had, he had sent me some words and he wanted me to put those on tape. And when I got that tape it was totally exactly what he said. There was words, barely any punctuation, just a bunch of words. And from, I hadn't read a script or anything, but from that, I realized that this guy was a recruit and, um, and it was in some kind of training thing, but still there was no character description or anything. So we went in my backyard. We rented that giant camera again and the deck <laughs> and the whole bit. And, you know, they were like, you know, cam video cameras were like the size of Volkswagens, you know, Beatles back then. They were huge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, you, we went in the backyard and we went up against this fence. And uh, Steve did the off-camera stuff and I did all the words. Um, and I, I, I honestly, the only thing I can remember is, is, is to, I played it as close to myself as I could, um, because in, in the end, um, it had no context whatsoever. And, and the, what this, the words that I said weren't, weren't part of the script anyway. He, he wrote something separate to see if I could act, I think, you know. Mm. So I just played it really close to my young self, you know. Right. But, yeah. but here's the thing, Vince, did you, in, it didn't say that he was um, he was unbalanced. He was a little slow. The character did it say that, or you created that? No, no. In the script, he was going to have to be weak-minded in some way. There was not. It was never defined how. Oh, okay. But because in the original novel, he was a skinny little guy, and Stanley didn't like that and Stanley wanted him to make make him weak in another way with his being overweight and being a kind of uneducated kid uh, uh, from you know middle America somewhere and um, some kind of um, you know rural environment yeah and and and, and so uh, but I didn't know any of that until until I got there and I was handed the script. Um, and then, and, and Stanley doesn't talk about character as much like Barry, Barry's much the same and a lot of directors are much the same actually. Um, and I, you know, they're great directors. Um, they, you know, Stanley made it very clear that he didn't talk about script, he didn't talk about story, he didn't talk about acting, he didn't wanna know anything about that stuff. Your cast, Get there, do it, or get fired, one or the other. He was a hard nose, right? Like he was the type of guy. Hard nose. He wasn't a hard nose. Like he didn't say that, but that was. He didn't say what I just said, but that was the, the feeling. Like there were people around us getting fired for not coming in up with the goods and not being responsible actors, not knowing their lines, not, not uh, bringing in a full out character. You're in a fucking Stanley Kubrick movie for fuck's sake. You can't mess about. You know, well, you got to bring a lot of ideas. I mean, he—that's what he expects, from, right? Yeah, not, not only a lot, but the idea. You have to bring the right. idea, the idea that's going to work. And and uh, it's not about uh, taking shots. It's about taking the shot. Right. And and uh, he made that in his own way, which only was very. Uh, particular and very specific of Stanley. He had a way of communicating without saying anything. He had a way of creating a vibe, a, uh, a tone to to the work environment without 
ever explaining what that tone is. He was very and very interesting and very uh, and look, you know, he treated me like a prince, like you know, uh, I, I mean, there was a couple of us on that second that could do no wrong, and for no good reason other than um, Matthew and myself and Arliss and I mean, we I don't I didn't know the other guys in the, in the in the I don't know the other guys experience in the Vietnam stuff because I wasn't privy to that. So I only know my experience with Matthew and Arliss. And you know, we were treated really well, you know, especially Matthew and I. Um which which scene which scene was that it took 2 days and there was numerous takes that one scene. What scene was that? Well, I'm not going to say, but it wasn't Matthew or I or Arliss. It was another actor, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he was having a tough time. And uh, Stanley was. Um, I've seen many directors in that position, um, where couldn't couldn't get what he wanted, and it went on for two days for one line. One line. Yeah, one line. Holy shit! Yeah. Wow. Over. Somewhere between 70 and 80 takes, I think. Vince, you gained 80 pounds. That's some hard-ass shit to do, one. And two, you were out of shape doing boot camp, right? I mean, simple as that. You had all that fat in you that... Yeah, yeah. Do you have any uh, injuries? I mean, you know, yeah. you gained 80 pounds and you're running at 6'4". I know your knees are going to be shot. Well, I blew my knee out, yeah. I blew my right knee out very, very badly, where I had to go to Princess Grace Hospital and get surgery um, immediately. And uh, and then I had to take a few weeks off. And and what and I and so a lot of that boot camp stuff underneath my fatigues, I'm wearing um, uh, a, a brace, a very old-fashioned British brace that they put on your leg um when you get knee strain and that's underneath my um my fatigues for a lot of that boot camp stuff marching and the cape the, the monkey patrol with the rifles and all that i'm wearing a brace but it, it was during one of the cal one of the uh the obstacle course things where i came off of a log came down on my knee and just blew it out really really badly Ouch. So and you had you guys had to delay, and also you had your drill sergeant. He got into the car. He got into a car accident, right? So yeah, that was did. delayed there too. He broke all his ribs on one side. Yeah, I actually uh, came home, came to New York for a month during that period when when Lee went out. There was nothing to shoot, um, and uh, Stanley didn't want to shoot the stuff the the end scene yet. Uh, with, uh, you know, he couldn't do it without, without um, Lee. So, I actually went back to New York, and I, I, I went, I went to work at, the, I went back to work at the Hard Rock, um, with all that weight on, and I, I worked there. And then, uh, you know, that's the other thing. When I finished Full Metal Jacket, I went straight back to bouncing. Yeah. And oh, isn't that crazy? You would think, well, you know what, you know, I, I made a movie. I don't have to work as a bouncer anymore. It's one with the best directors. And all of a sudden, no, you're going back to work. Yeah, I didn't, what's about, I didn't stop being, uh, 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 I didn't stop having a, a real job until I, I couldn't, I didn't have the time to do it. I just didn't buy the fact that um, I didn't, I didn't like the idea of money coming in and, uh, putting all my eggs in one basket. So I, you know, I, I, but then, you know, movies started coming and I started to realize, okay, this is, you know, I guess I'm, I guess I'm an actor now. That's what I wanted to do. And I guess I'm getting the shot. So Vincent, yeah. let me ask you a question. Why did Stanley want this shot so bad right here? He said something with the camera. He wanted to be a little on top and your face going up. And he told you the day before, I want you big the next day. This is the shot that I want you big. What did you have to craft to become in that big? When a director says, I want you big, what are you thinking as an actor? Well, there's two things. There's um, 
there's two things. There's one is that particular shot, which where he raises the camera. That's a kind of signature thing that he does. Mm -hmm. um, that that shot where it's it's your brow takes the forefront, right, and that kind of thing. And so the the idea of the performance of that. Um, the, the idea of the performance of that scene, yeah, he, he said he wanted it Lon Chaney big. And I, and I was very fortunate to be um, studying uh, th these old black and white horror films. So it kind of worked out. I can hear my son. Can, can you, can I, I know this is weird, but I need to go for just a second. Is that okay? Just, but stay online. Don't just go. I'm not going to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Will, I'll give you more time. Let me just go do that real quick. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. It's live, but no, that's don't worry. Don't worry. I just, uh, I'm just saying. Oh well, you know what I just said. I said, Vince. I said, a man that doesn't spend time with his family is not a real man. So you're hanging out with your son just a little bit, all right? <laughs> yeah, and this is the world. Yeah, thank you for that. This is the world that we that that we live in right now. So I'm not my. I'm I'm here at the house with my with my sons and. Uh, okay. They, no, it's okay, brother. Trust me. Well, cool. Family man. That's all it counts. So, Vince, this shot right here, when he told you, I want you to be big the next day. Yeah. What so, this is what happened. Let me tell you the story. Let Go me ahead. tell you the story. So, I told you before that he never talked about uh, uh, acting or performance or anything like that. And so, it was rare. Like, uh, for me, it was never that he said anything up to, up to this certain night where we were walking back. We knew we were going to shoot that scene, mm -hmm. the scene he was looking at there, the next morning. And Stanley had this thing where he would clear his throat before he spoke. So you'd always go, ah, ah, and you knew he was going to say something. So I'm walking back to my car, and so is he and a couple other guys. And he does that, and I turn. I know he's going to say something, so I turn around to see what he's going to say. And he's, he's, he want, he's talking to me, and he says, you know what you're going to do tomorrow? I said, yeah, I think so. And, um, and he said, uh, okay. Um, and there's this pause, and I, I waited because I knew he had something else to say. And I was also just shocked that he was speaking to me about what we were going to shoot because it was the first time mm -hmm. um, in months and months. And uh, he he said, it, it needs to be big. It needs to be Lon Chaney big. And I knew exactly, you know, it's like, it was like a gift. Like, um, there was like I've been had a couple of those moments in my career where it was like Christmas, you know like a little kid getting their best Christmas present ever, because um, this is exactly the confirmation that I needed that he said that. It was exactly what I had been working on. I had been talking to my mentor, who who still is, uh, Sharon Chatton, who I studied with back then, who still teaches in L.A. Um, about it, I have um, back at my flat, at the exact time he was saying that to me, I had you know, a Lon Chaney uh, film and several other horrors, Lon Chaney Jr. and other Dolagosi stuff. And I had all that stuff in, on, in VHS tapes on the de and on the, my living room table at my flat. So it was like this kismet kind of thing that, you know, I knew, you know it was like, you know, it, it rarely happens, that kind of stuff, but it was like Christmas, you know. Oh, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on the same page as you know, the, uh, with a director like him and you on the same page, that gives you much more confidence coming on set. Totally, and he was, you know, especially from him, who there was just no bullshit. You know, he was not. He expected you to come and do your job, like I said, and to for him to to say something, and for me to understand fully as a young man is quite. So I, I think back at it as being nearly impossible, and but but it happened, and and then and then on the day, the next day, we we only shot my stuff, we only did uh, three shots and, and three takes, um, not including the the effect. And back then there was no CGI, so they actually blew tissue and chicken blood. Um, <laughs> past my head with a with an air gun so it goes behind in that picture imagine it flying back behind my head and hitting the wall behind my head so it was shot at like an angle uh -huh. Uh -huh. and um 
I mean, they did that in one take too. And uh, we were done. And uh, on, they shot everybody's stuff first and then mine last. And we were done with the scene. And he, he had a chair. You see that? Can you see that chair on my wall? Yeah, yeah. That's Stanley Kubrick's chair. Oh, wow. Matthew Modine took that and gave it to me as a gift. And that picture here, um, can you see that picture? No, no, I just see dark. That's it. Okay. Uh, wait a second. If you move your laptop to the right. Or the right or the yeah, keep going, keep going. Oh, there it is. Yeah, right there. That one. Yeah. That's me um, on, laying on the grass, and that's Matthew taking that. Arliss Howard is right next to me. You can't see him, but those are Arliss's glasses I'm wearing. I just put his glasses on for a moment when they took that. Those are all taken on the set by Modine. Wow. And um, so he, he was sitting in that chair, Stanley, and he had a chair exactly like that without his name on it. Um, that one has his name on it. Um, sitting right next to uh, his, and it, the, he invited me to sit next to him. And back then, the mo he, he used a monitor like Coppola did, um, even way back then. And But the monitor screens were like only about that big. Right. Yet the monitor itself was like super long, like it was like about that long. Yeah. The screen was only like that big, like prehistoric stuff. And um, we watched those takes. And on the second take, um, his hand came over and rested on the top of my hand for the second and the last take. Right, right. And and I knew when he did that, he didn't say a word. I knew. You know, I knew that I'd done the right thing for him, and I was—I'll never forget that moment. And if if I may, can I just continue a little bit? Are you, if, Vincent, are you kidding me? You're unlimited, baby. Keep talking. These stories so, are great. <laughs> if I may, the, the 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 when Stanley died, um, I remember they invited me to the DGA invited me to this thing with all these other actors who had played iconic parts in his movies. So Nicholson was there and some of his friends and Warren Beatty was there and like all these, uh, and um, all these actors that I totally felt um, were on a whole other level than me. But um, I was fortunate enough to be invited. And they showed a, a video of Stanley talking to, making a speech for the, DGA that he only shot a few weeks before he died and they're playing this and they're playing it on a giant screen like a big 30 foot screen and it's this videotape of Stanley that he was obviously videotaping himself and he's talking and I, you know I, I I wasn't moved by it he, I know that he had died and and I didn't you know I was I was conscious of the fact that this was uh, I was not affected by by him in any way dying while watching this tape. And that stuck with me for a long time. And then many years later, one of his, uh, his, his, his brother-in-law, um, who was a producer of his movies, of, of Stanley's movies, um, uh, started a tour of Stanley's stuff, his cameras, his props, Mm -hmm. All the literature, his scripts, everything that was involved, sets, everything that was involved in the making of Stanley Kubrick movies, every one of them. And he toured the world with that. Wow. And it was an amazing, it was, it was a, it was a exhibit of something like 20 or 30 rooms of stuff. And you would visit the, the Barry Lyndon room or the shining room. And then in that room would be all the stuff, the props, the costumes, everything were letters. Stanley wrote all of his, the cameras that he originally built for Barry Lyndon, wow. um, like every, all his own cameras, all his letters to and from critics and all. Anyway, it was this amazing thing, but I had never gotten missed the one in Paris. I missed the one in London. And finally I'm doing a job in LA and I, driving by uh, the museum, the Los Angeles Museum there, Lama, and, and it's there. It's opening in two days. Oh, okay. And so I called them and I said, hey, uh, can I come? 
Um, and they said, well, is it really you know, Vincent D'Onofrio or whatever? And I'm like, yeah, it's really him. How can I, I'll send you an email to prove it, whatever. And so I sent them an email and they came, they came right back to me and said, sure, just come. We'll, we'll, we'll walk you through the whole thing. And so my wife and I went. And uh, there was a few people there, not a lot. It was just sort of like a, it wasn't quite open yet, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll never forget this, Eddie. So um, we're walking into the place and the curator's talking to me. And as we go into the place and we're having a conversation and I see that chair in a glass case, oh, that exact wow. chair. Holy shit. And it's sitting in a glass case in front of me and I walk towards it. I hear the curator talking to me, but his voice kind of goes womp, 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 womp. Yeah. And I'm walking towards this thing and I lost it. Oh my I, God. I, Tears started pouring out of my eyes. I couldn't, uh, it, 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 I never expected for that to happen. And um, I'm glad it did. And it was extraordinary. And I, the, and the thing that kept going through my mind when I was crying in front of this curator and my wife and, and, and Stanley's chair, I know this sounds really mushy, but it's true. No, no, no. I want you to be mushy. Show, show me. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So, um, you know, I'm thinking of that moment when he put his hand on my hand and, and it was extraordinary. Um, so to change the subject, which is, really kind of interesting <laughs> in in the full metal jacket room mm-hmm. there was a monitor on the wall and it was on it was tape a videotape in a loop of matthew myself and stanley in stanley's trailer which was sort of like a bus um, that had been cleared out and like a, you know, like a Greyhound bus kind of thing that had been cleared out and all this seating and desk and stuff. It seemed like that to me and in my memory. And it looked like that in the videotape. The weird thing about it, Eddie, and the reason why I bring up this tape is because I'm watching this thing. I walk, walk in. The first thing I see is this thing. and I see Matthew's face and he's, you know, 24 or something. Yeah. And then I see this, I see Stanley, and then I see me and the camera. I don't know who was shooting it. Probably Leon Vitale was shooting it. And it's going around and the three of us, and we're writing a scene. Wow. So imagine writing a scene with Stanley Kubrick, with Matthew Modine, and with Stanley. The problem was, Eddie, is that I cannot remember it, nor do, can I relate to it at all. It. It's like this kid. I'm looking at this kid. He's 24 with this other 24-year-old, Matthew, who I love and I know. And him I can relate to. Stanley's the same. I can relate to him. But I could not remember that happening, nor can I remember the idea idea of it happening, why we were doing it, you know, and the only answer I have to that is that we all held him in such high regard, this guy, not only because of we, um, if you were an actor back then, you knew all of Stanley Kubrick's movies. Yeah. You know, you watched them in triple and double features and you know, we, we used to go, we used, my friends and I, we used to go see 2001 Clockwork Orange and Dr. Strain Love in one sitting. We'd walk in in the morning, we'd leave in the late afternoon. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what? People think he's from London, but he's re- he's from the Bronx originally. He's from the Bronx, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the same thing when uh, the story, when <laughs> he called you and says, listen, um, this is Stanley, and you thought it was one of your boys. And yeah. you hung up on him, and, and then he called back. He's like, "Don't hang up on me. This is Stanley, right? Is that?" Yeah, what? yeah, totally. I thought he was British. I had no idea he was even. I didn't know much about him. I just knew about his movies. I wasn't a film student. I was an acting student. So exactly, I was influenced by his films. Um, Vincent, here's my question: Is there a yeah. huge difference between theater 
actors and film and TV actors? I mean, can you, or is it, you know, I hear stories that theater actors are too much. Film, just tone it down, stay still. What's your take on that? A lot of things come to my mind. I, I, there's a difference in what you do when you're doing it. Like when you're doing a play, you you work differently than when you're doing a film, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a. It's also just as intense and as pleasurable because it's a whole different process. Most films, you don't have any rehearsal. 99.9% of the films, you don't have any rehearsal period. You don't know anybody um, when you when you're actually doing it for real on the day when it counts you don't know anybody really yet um takes weeks and weeks and weeks in a play you've rehearsed with somebody for four weeks uh, people a bunch of people or whatever you know everybody and and it's a whole completely different process and sure you have to her be heard in the back row and Mm -hmm. um as far as evoking real feelings it's the same right right you need to deliver the correct emotion that services the story, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Just like in film, but it's a different process. But something else comes to mind when you say that, and it's it's that the, the only um, thing that is different for me as far as the experience of it is is that you, walk, you work with incredible actors when you're doing the theater. Oh, yeah, I agree, yeah. You know, the 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 last time, for instance, as an example, because it's happened every time. But as an example, a couple of years ago, Ethan and myself and a bunch of other people, Ethan directed it actually, this play called Clive, which was an adaptation of Bert Talk Breck's play Ball. And we put this, Ethan put this troupe of actors together, including me and him and I, we did this show. In that show, the men and women, like Zoe Kazan, I mean, it just goes on and on, um, were just phenomenal actors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and, and the composers of the piece and the musician, uh, who's, well, who's also a musician, composer, Dana Lynn, the, the, the Gaines brothers, Shelby and Lathan Gaines, the composers of the music, creators of the music. Um, these people are so fucking talented these actors and other you know every day i would look forward to going to work and and working with them on stage and in that play um i got to work with at least half uh, or maybe a little less than half of all the performers in that show work i mean by way of i'm in the same show but actually do scenes with them connect with them on stage yeah and you know that's sticks out to me most when you talk about theater and film is that the percentage of incredible actors in theater is so much higher than it is in film. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, without a doubt. Shit. <laughs> you know what I believe in, you know, in theater, you know, you rehearsing's great. Um, in film, people don't like to rehearse. I mean, look, look at your guy, the drill sergeant in, in the movie full metal jacket. He was yeah. actually a consultant, but he wanted that part. He made a video and Stanley was convinced and said, all right, and there was no rehearsals with that guy, right? Yeah. So back to theater. What I love about theater is that every day you could create different things coming on set. You're like, you know what? Let me try it this way. You know what? Let me try it that way. You know what I mean? Or, you know, your emotional preparation. Shit. It's, you know, eight days, eight shows a week. Sometimes you're like, oh, man, it didn't really hit me in the gut. Because I know acting, it has to hit you in the gut. That's a true feeling. But if it's too much air, you're thinking too much. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll add to that 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 you you obviously have to be careful that you're not going to – that any – one of the complexities of what you just said is that you have to also keep in mind that you're not going to – screw anybody up by any changes you've made and that you're not going to... Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, but, but I'll... I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm but, saying but, if you... More, yeah. more than that, yeah. But more than that, you have to um, always make sure that you're servicing the story in, in, in the right way. But back to what you said, that there is this adventurous kind of freewheeling 
aspect, if you will, um, that you can live during as long as you stay in those in that con in that context. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. You're right. Yeah. yeah. As far as crafting, you know, there's nights you'd be like, "Damn, I didn't really feel that shit. I got to find something to get that feeling again." Right. I mean, yeah. that happened on, on stage sometimes. You're like, nah, shit. I didn't really feel that. But the day before, you felt it. It was great. You know what I mean? So then you yeah. got to uh, adjust because, you know, acting's all about creating behavior. That's the bottom line. If there's no behavior, you're a fraud. You're not Yeah. yeah. Uh, except I will, I will say that, and, 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 as, and, and as a lesson and a reminder to myself and to, as a lesson to less experienced actors out there, that um, your job is to bring it. And um, you eventually, through your experience and your studies, you better learn how to bring it every night. I, I have been standing, um, I won't say names, but I have been standing with actors outside of doors waiting to enter the stage, waiting for my cue and be this close to the other actors because you're in this cramped little space waiting for your cue and watching them bring it, watching them get themselves so that when they step out, they're coming from somewhere, they know why, they're gonna have arrived somewhere. They know why. They know what they're doing, and they know where they're going afterwards. And they are bringing it as you're paused, well, hell as you're waiting for the cue. Mm -hmm. And they, and, and hopefully, I'm doing the same. And and you know, I, 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 let me just say this one thing. So Ethan, my buddy, there were times that were. Many there was a few of us like this, but there were times where Ethan and I were standing in these these exact kind of cramped spaces, and the two of us had to walk into a couple of situations together as our characters. And you know, to see the look in your buddy's eyes of the fervor of the how he filled himself with the character and this kind of energy so that by the time our cue came where I was to knock before somebody opened their door for us, to watch my buddy and to to be feeding each other back and forth. When I think of it in hindsight at the moment, you know, you're just doing it. It's just an extraordinary thing. You know, so I, I just want to say that um, sure, some nights don't go as well as others, but um, um, and I say this to my students all the time because somebody said it to me that um, the ch the struggle to achieve 100% in our art or whether whoever you are, a musician or, or a painter or poet, whatever you do, it's artistic, creative. And I guess in anything you do in life, I think the struggle to achieve 100% is the key, knowing that you can never actually achieve 100% to keep yeah. struggling to do that no matter what. And to know that that struggle ends up to be your performance. That's what the audience gets. Yeah, yeah. You know, Vince, you turned down The Sopranos, which kind of was a good thing because Law & Order came up right after. But you turned it down because... I didn't turn down The Sopranos. I turned down a care a part... Okay, after, right about that. Yes, you did. after the after the Sopranos was was already a mega hit. Right. Chase approached me about a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I did turn down. You're right, and I had these reasons to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you had reasons, but then, um, you know, Law and Order. That's a you being a New Yorker and a family man. That's kind of a dream come true for an actor to stay locally and work and see their family. Did you yeah. feel great about that? Was that the reason why you took Law and Order? It's the reason why I took Law and Order, but it didn't work out. What? That, it, it didn't. I it, it it was a I was lied to by everybody around me, including the people that made the show, that I would see my family more. I, in fact, I swore my family less than than any than ever before that. 
Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that, but, yeah. but I was right about as far as like you coming in. Okay. You know, I'm in New York. York. Sure. You know, my and, family I, and, I still, and I still do that. Totally. Totally. And I still do that. I still do, will do parts because they're in New York. They're written well. Like I'm doing the Godfather of Harlem. I'm doing it. Um, one of the reasons why Chris Brancato, who's also a very close man who I love dearly, he's the showrunner and um, he's a very talented writer. And um, he's doing this thing, you know, this, uh, Forrest Whitaker and I are doing The Godfather of Harlem and Brancato's writing it. And, and one of the things that he knew would get my attention was the fact that it's shot in New York because he, he, he knows that I didn't want to play a racist. And, and, and he had asked me just, you know, would you been, and I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and, but, you know, we're, Chris and I are, are, are brothers and, you know, we're like brothers and he just kept on me and on me and he kept enticing me and throwing me this way. And he would tell me stories about, you know, oh, you know, I was in a church and I saw you and like, you know, right. he was so hard. In, in the most guinea way possible, trying to get me to do this part <laughs> as, a fellow, as a fellow WAP, and 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 I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't do it, and and uh, I just didn't want to do it, and then, um, but 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 he eventually did convince me with the help of a conversation that I put out there on Twitter that had nothing to do with Chris. Um, I, I asked the question on Twitter without net mentioning the project or anything, I, I said on Twitter, is it possible for somebody to play an, an irredeemable um, racist in this climate today? Mm. And it was an, uh, an overwhelming yes, as long as you play the shit out of it and you don't hold back. So the point is very clear. And they were right, you know. And and by the way, to give Chris credit, that's what he was saying to me the whole time. He said the reason why I'm coming to, I need a good actor to play it. Right. Um, but you know, Vincent, you are committed. You're in a, you commit to your character, and I'm surprised that you asked that because I know you. When you play a character, you are committed. You are not playing it. You are that guy. Yeah, but the, but but the reason why I ask is because it hurts. Right. Well, of course, yeah. But remember, it's not Vincent that's playing a racist. It's the characters yeah. that I understand. You. But that I understand, and it hurt. But it still hurts people, and it still hurts me to do it. Right. You know, right. I I to tell the truth about something so disgusting mm -hmm. is. It, it, it maybe it's for the good, but it still hurts. Oh, of course, you know, Vincent. In my in my acting school, I studied Meisner right here, Maggie Flanagan, the conservatory. And my second year, we were doing characters, and we had to play a bigot. And it really hurt me. You know, I picked a guy that you know character that like I hate Muslims and I don't give a shit and. One thing my teacher taught me, Eddie, if you play a bigot, really be a bigot. It's the character's part. I'm like, yeah, but it hurts me. He's like, of course it's going to hurt you. But if you play it, be it from your character's point of view. And I know where you're coming from. You know what I mean? Because being a bigot, being racist, that's the, it's terrible. It's the worst. That's the worst. You know, and also you have to remember the company I'm in. You know, it's like the, 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 the talent on that set the 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 writing from Chris and his crew, his writing crew, is top like top notch. Like these guys are great at what they do. Oh, yeah. They're they're peaking in their career. These writers right now. Yeah. The, these particular writers on the show, they they are especially Chris. He's he's writing the shit out of the show, mm -hmm. and um, and from two different perspectives with the with with um, the help of his, his writing staff. And, um, and then you have these ultimate, ultimate performers who are, you know, the, 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 the black actors on our show are 
you know, these actors are just so high caliber, you know, Forrest Whitaker, for one, he's, you know, how you said, I mean, he's just, you know. And his girl that plays with him, like, she's a badass. I'm like, damn, oh my God. And and every actor and actress that comes on that show uh, are, if they're there for a day or they're there for a few weeks. Yeah. I mean... You know, I talked to Catherine Narducci. Uh, she was on your show. And I I texted her yesterday. I said, hey, give me a scouting report about Vincent. How is he on set? Oh, my God. The best. He gives you so much. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I know where you're coming from, man. Well, so so she's, I, by the way, she's so awesome, that lady. Yeah. She's too awesome. Mm -hmm. Great woman. Well, yeah. yeah, she's just wonderful. And then on set, you know, she's just an absolute pleasure because you can just, you know, some actors you can throw off. They're just not up for everything. Mm -hmm. You cannot, you cannot knock Narducci off her feet. You cannot. You cannot make that woman balance, lose her balance when it comes, you know, on a set. She is just there as present as she could possibly be you know it's like amazing and i and you know that which just makes me fall in love with her because i i fall in love with all actors that are like that but men or women they're just i become smitten over them um i just want to complete one thought when it comes to godfather harlem so the idea of working in that atmosphere with all that talent the actors you know, the, 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 what, there's one there's one actress, her name is Nicole Salter, who has won an Obie for her writing, and, 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 and but also she's this amazing actress. I'll never forget her coming in and just rocking the day. You know, we had some heavy scenes to do, her and I, and... Vincent, who was the actress that Boris Whitaker's daughter, she's like a, a heroin addict? Yes, yes. Um, can't think of her name, but she's fucking incredible. Oh, she's special. I was like, holy shit. She's yeah. good. Oh, my God. Oh, my yeah. God. I was like, whoa. Her behavior was, like, on point. Like, holy shit. You yeah. Yeah, totally. And and the... the um, these... these So the, the idea of being there and, and, and the idea of... of being there and with all of that talent, it, what it does is it makes the, it makes it, it, it you're really living it then. Oh. And, and so when it's written so well, by the end of the day, you're, you're, you know, you're sick to your stomach when you're playing. I, I, let me speak for myself. I'm sick to my stomach yeah. by chin, by, by playing chin. He, he, he's, you know, the idea of being him for those hours, saying the things that he says, unless it's family stuff that we're doing, if it's, but a lot of it is, is not family stuff in the first season. A lot of it is just straight out racism and, and, and the being threatened by the rising of the black community. Um, and, and this idea of early America, and we're still this way, by the way, being scared of the black man. It, it, you know, this whole idea of that is just is just so damaging. And 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 you know, so you leave, you know, you know, because of that great writing, because of the performances like Force, because of all these 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 great um, actors. I, I mean, it makes it, it's humanity, and it, you feel it. You feel it for real. You feel it. And I talk to my wife about it, and I talk to my friends about it, and, and I, I, I try to, to, uh, you know, to to bring it every day. So it's tough. Uh, I, um, Antoinette Crow is the girl that you're talking about. Yeah. The play Jackson's daughter. Nice. Yeah. She is, I met her for the first time at the read-through mm -hmm. and just looking at her, 
just watching her say the words. She wasn't even acting, really. None of us were. You never really acted with teachers. Um, I remember turning to Corinne and saying, "That, that, that's an actress right there. You watch. I have no idea what she's going to do, mm-hmm. but that's this this woman." Is an actress. How the way she told Forrest get out of here while she was uh, in bed, like you know, was so raw. I was like, holy shit, <laughs> you know. And then Forrest Whitaker's wife, I mean, she is badass. Like she will, <laughs> I catch you cheating on me, I will fucking kill you. <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's pretty intense. Yeah. It's, it's pretty intense. Did, the, uh, Vincent, uh, did Chris promise you? Did you have that fear? About, you know, oh, no, you know what? I'm getting offered in New York. I don't want another law and order situation with numerous hours. And, you know, I can't really see my family. Did you warn him about that and say, Chris, this is my time limit throughout the day? Well, I mean, I wouldn't talk in terms of time limit, but we did talk in terms of, you know, you have to know going into your day at work that it is what it is. It's It's long days. I get it. Well, you're going to be there until you get it right. So. Or until you're done, one or the other. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, but yes, yes, um, I, I did talk to him about that. We had those conversations, and I really didn't have to talk to Chris, but I, I have talked to others about it. Uh-huh. Um, because Chris wrote the last eight episodes, he ended Criminal Intent for for us. Oh, uh, okay. Wolf hired him to, to uh, write the last eight, um, which was its own arc to finish the show off. And, you know, let me talk about Criminal Intent a little bit. Look, right. you know, it, it, it was very, 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 very rough on my life mm-hmm. because of those hours. And it was rough on my family because of those hours. But it was also rough on every crew member every other actor, especially Kate Irby, because she was in every scene that I was in. And right. she was off and she was, most of the time we were doing that show, a single mother with two kids. No way. Oh, yes, way. Yeah, and, and also, I have to say, that because of her integrity as an actress, mm-hmm. it makes it even harder. Yeah. Because she's not phoning it in. You know, even with, you know, the Law and Order shows are are renowned for their exposition. Mm-hmm. You actors have to deliver a lot of exposition, and some can do it, and some can't. And we had a lot of it to do on that show, and Kate was the best of it ever. Not only the emotional stuff and her character work, but she's brilliant at, and obviously, and all the other stuff she does too. Not just Law and Order. But, but I, I just want to say that that this show was extraordinary uh, for my career, and in the, in and some of the best writers I'll ever 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 work with wrote for that show, right. Um, right. and uh, and uh, you know you know it's you know we had uh, Frank Prinzi was our DP when we first started he's like this incredible New York cinematographer um, he, he's like one of the top guys around um, we the producers uh, some of the producers that we had were, were from film and um, and then Dick Wolf himself um, uh, don't forget also other actors who play, you know, on that show, other than Kate and I, were just all phenomenal actors in their own right, you know. And 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 and, and we, but but Dick Wolf himself was a champion for the show. You know, he really wanted to make Criminal Intent, mm-hmm. and he wanted me to do a good job at it. And he, he, you know, the thing about Wolf is that I was able to have a, a was able to have a, a relationship with him, which. It, and he championed my ideas mm-hmm. because it brought a lot to the table when it came to that show. And I wanted to make this character different um, if it was going to keep my interest. Um, he did He did warn me early on to uh, push a little bit away from the table or it was going to wear me out too quick. Right. And, yeah, he did. 
he did, and I I didn't listen to him, <laughs> and I should have, I should have, um, because I because in hindsight I would have done um, work that would have been satisfying anyway, I think for everybody and for myself, and so um, yeah, very smart guy, and we still talk, uh, Dick and I, and and. So, you know, I, I don't want to leave the topic of criminal intent without adding uh, how important that show was in my life. Of course, yeah. yeah. You know what I like about in the, the later you were with Bruce Willis? You know, as an actor, I learned you've got to create the relationship once the curtain opens up, or once the film opens up, to create a relationship. And I love your relationship with Bruce Willis. You guys are like best friends <laughs> shooting the shit, you know what I mean? Most of my interviews are shooting this shit, but I love that. You know what I mean? Was it simple for you with Bruce? Bruce and I had worked together before. Uh -huh. And we also, he was a bartender and I was a bouncer at Kamikaze's when we were kids. A, a bar called Kamikaze's in New York. Mm -hmm. Was it um, the 80s? Yeah, in the 80s, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, the early Broadway. 80s. Broadway. No, no, I'm talking about the street. Oh, no, no, no. It was Midtown. Um, it was on the on the on the west side, under one of the elevators in Midtown. Um, uh, do you remember there used to be? There used to be a roller rink. Do you remember the roller rink that used to be there? Was it on top? Like you would go up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you would. It'd be like twenty floors or something like that. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was it was part of when that closed down for years, mm -hmm. they made they part of that was made into this this bar we worked in. If I'm not mistaken, I might I might be confusing two things, but I think I'm correct about this. Anyway, so yeah, so so uh I like Bruce a lot. Um Bruce and I get along really well. Mm -hmm. Um we don't know each other that good, but we've been in each other's circles for a, a long time. Um and I have an, a, 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 an affection for him. And um, you're right, um, there's a really comfortable thing between uh, him and I. You never really know why that is, but it's true, it is. And um, he, he's also one of those guys that will do anything for you. Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah he, he worked his ass off. <laughs> I remember they told me about his audition. He came in, what was that show he came on? Yeah, moonlighting. Yeah, what was it called? Moonlighting. Moonlighting, and he went in there. He had a rough night because he worked the night before as a bartender. Goes into audition. He's like, "You guys don't even fucking want me, so fuck you all." You know what I mean? And he just left the audition, and he got a call back. <laughs> like, you know, it's 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 amazing how accidents happen in this business. You know yeah, I mean? like with you, Matt Matthew walking by. Um, you know, there's so many accident stories. You're like, oh, shit, I never knew that, you know? Like, I mean, and you know what, Vincent? Also, I learned about you, too, when I did my research, is that you just, when you graduated from uh, acting school, you just said, look, I just want to look good on stage. There was no film and TV existed in your mind. None of that. Am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, I never saw myself as a, as a film film actor, right? No, no, I just wanted to be a character actor in theater. You know, that's 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 what I had trained to do, and mm -hmm. I thought that I would excel in that, but I didn't. I, I I got a shot to be in a movie from you know one of the best directors at that time in the world, and I haven't stopped working in film since or television since because of that guy. You know, so. Well, look, man, you had a great career in. <laughs> You know, a working actor, a trained actor, got a good family. You got it going on, my man. <laughs> you know? Thank you. Yeah. It's good. Good, yeah. Well, listen, I know you got to go and you got to teach, but it was an honor talking to you, seriously. Eddie, you're very, you're very sweet. You're very nice to talk to. You make it very easy, and I appreciate that very much. Oh, absolutely. I, look, I'm not here to get dirt. I'm not like that. I defend my actors and my athletes because I have a huge background with that. So, you know, I just want classic stories, how you got there, you know, 
and people that are watching to get inspired. Because there's a kid right now, 18-year-old kid, just graduated from high school, is probably watching this interview and saying, you know what? I want to train like Vincent. Because when you were a kid, your sister had cute girlfriends, and that's how you got into acting. And you saw somebody on stage, a really good actor, while you were in high school, and you said, this guy is special, but I could be better if I train, am I correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah, your your very your your details are a little off, but basically that's it. The details that's a little off. Damn it, I suck. <laughs> no, it's it's because stories get so convoluted. You know, I read them and they're always a little off. But right, but yeah, but yeah, basically yes. And and I hope that that what you're saying is true. I hope somebody is inspired by it. And I. Before I leave you, I for that kid out there that you're talking about, that boy or that girl, or um, adults. Whoever, a human, a human being, I don't care, but he's inspired. Yeah, I, I would say to them that um, to give it a go, that, that um, perseverance is one of the things you need. And um, you're, you, it's the only way you're going to get a shot, so you might as well, that's what you're going to need, perseverance. Exactly. Now, Vince, I'm going to end this right now, but don't go anywhere. I need something else from you, okay? So I'm going to end the broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Vincent D'Onofrio, we love him the best. Still crafting, still working. Legend to me. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on a minute. <laughs> hey, this is Vincent D'Onofrio. Please subscribe to Eddie Motto's YouTube show. It's going to be worth it, I promise. See ya.